Grab your popcorn and goobers. It's time for Motherhood in Hollywood with your host, Heather Brooker. This is a crude prude's perspective on being a full-time mom in showbiz. She's not a perfect mom, but she can play one on TV. Hold on to your butts. Here's Heather. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 16 of Motherhood in Hollywood. I'm Heather Brooker, and I'm having a blast doing this show. And I'm so, so glad that uh, everybody else seems to be enjoying it as well. Uh, At least the feedback I've been getting seems to be pretty positive. Uh, Today's show is a really great show because my guest is Steve Braun. Steve is an acting teacher here at a very well-known studio called BGB Studios. It's the Bramon Garcia Braun Studios. And he is the Braun of uh, Bramon Garcia Braun. So I wanted to sit down with him because he is a dad. He's actually the first dad we're going to have, we're having on Motherhood in Hollywood. And I wanted to hear his perspective of how he um, was an actor for many, many years and then decided to transition into teaching and how he sort of found his calling and found himself a little bit more through that life change. It's a pretty interesting story. And also he has some really great information for actors. And, um, you know, we dive, we dive a little bit into acting techniques and, um, all of that good stuff. I have very strong opinions about acting techniques, but I feel like kind of a, a little bit of a phony if I ever like try to talk to somebody about it, because I, you know, while I did go to school at Oklahoma state and got a theater degree there, I didn't graduate with a theater degree. I didn't go to Juilliard. I didn't go to the Tisch School for Performing Arts or wherever the kids go um, to get their, you know, mastery of performing arts. <clears throat> I um, I actually stopped following my uh, acting lessons, I guess, or, you know, I dropped out of acting classes basically halfway through my uh, my college career and went into journalism. So for me... Um, even though I kind of found my way back into this career and back into Hollywood in sort of a roundabout way, it, it, uh, I always feel like I'm, I don't know, somehow not as good or not good enough whenever I talk to people who have like a master's in theater or, you know, I've been studying it their whole lives. Um, but you know, and then I'm reminded, uh, it's not true. Everybody's good enough. Everybody's got a place out here. We all have a place in this industry Sometimes <clears throat> it's just a little harder to carve out, and sometimes maybe you have to carve it out yourself, which is what I'm doing with Motherhood in Hollywood. Hey, did you see that? Did you see how I kind of brought it all around? Uh, so yeah, it's a great show today. I'm very excited to talk to Steve. I want to mention a couple of things. First of all, um, I am doing Motherhood in Hollywood all on my own, and all of the time that I put into it and all of the effort and I've put into it um, is I'm not getting paid for it basically is what I'm saying. So, um, I created an Amazon e-store in the hopes that if anybody, um, wants to go online and buy something, uh, or, you know, make a purchase of any of the things that I've selected through my website, then I get a portion of that and it might help. Uh, it will definitely help defray some of the costs here for motherhood in Hollywood. So if you can, uh, or if you're interested, you can go to motherhoodhollywood.com and check out my e-store. Also, uh, I had the great opportunity this past week to review a new product. It's a coloring mural for a company called Lulu Bee. And um, I have put that on my website as well. You'll be interested to hear some things I have to say about that. It actually was a lot of fun. Channing and I had a great time coloring with it. And the full review can be found at Motherhood and Hollywood dot com slash the inside scoop. So you want to go there. That will be where I'm putting a lot of the reviews um, on products I've tried or things I've tested or, you know, companies have been so gracious and reaching out to me and asking me to, to check out their stuff. And I'm more than happy to do that. So um, I will put all of the information there and kind of what Channing and I thought about these things on uh, motherhoodandhollywood.com slash the inside scoop. Get it? Because Hollywood, I'm kind of, I'm giving you like an inside scoop and shit. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what's happening. Um, really quick, I want to say thank you so much to everybody who is following me 
on Facebook, uh, Jamie Jackson. Hey, what's up, girl? How you doing? Thanks for following me on Facebook. And um, over on, I, that was everybody. I said I want to thank everybody, but really that was just one person. <laughs> and also over on Instagram. Instagram is blowing up, you guys. Uh, the Little Artistry Party, Clover and Birch, and Kittypedia. What a cute name. Thank you guys for following me and retweeting and, and liking all the pictures we're putting on Instagram. You can find Motherhood in Hollywood on Instagram and Facebook and on the web at motherhoodinhollywood.com. And also, I'm on the Twitter at MIH Podcast. And um, yeah, I mean, I try not to be too annoying with the Twitter, but usually it's just stuff that kind of pops in my brain randomly um, throughout the day. And I also, um, that's where you can get information about my guests and shows and and all that good stuff. So yeah, I think that's all I wanted to tell you guys. I still don't have a name for this part. The mommy monologue, maybe somebody suggested that that's a fun name. Um, the mom actor monologue, but it's also a mouthful. Oh, I'm very excited. Stay tuned to the next couple of weeks. Um, because I have a big announcement coming up. Uh, we're doing something really fun in December. So you want to make sure that you are, um, checking, listening to the show and checking the website for that information. Good times are coming. Uh, so that's about it, everybody. I'm going to, uh, clear my throat and then I'm going to, um, get right into the interview with Steve Braun, used to be my acting teacher and, um, such a sweet man, great father. And I know you guys are really going to love all of the things he has to share. Here's Steve. Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I know you're very busy here at the studio. It's my pleasure. Thank you for coming here. And, um, first of all, let's just start from the beginning, like all good stories. Um, you're from Canada, right? I am, yes. Do people say A to you a lot? No. <laughs> Sorry. Never. I mean, it, it's one of those things I think that's become uh, stereotypical. It's it's uh, it's the parody of the parody or whatever, but uh, we say it as much as you say, hey, you know, that's pretty good, hey, you know? Yeah. But I think inherent in it, and it's something deeper, is the notion that uh, I'm not going to commit to what I've just said. I, I need your validation and your engagement before I agree it's pretty cold, A. Eh? Like, I don't want to commit to, to that statement, so yeah. I need to... It's like some Cato Kalin stuff. You so, know, like, here in the, the U.S., it would be more like, um, is this okay, right? Or, no, yeah? All of that, yes, all definitely. <laughs> but, I, but I think just generally in terms of the culture, there is, you know, they're, they're quick to... Uh, to apologize uh, generally as a culture, you know, so it comes from that not wanting to commit to a statement, which once you come down here, you have to beat out of yourself or else you get trampled. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Especially like in New York and all that stuff, right? right? You do not want to be non committal. Right. Or an actor. Or an actor, right. right. <laughs> um, so you, uh, when did you start acting? When did you start performing? I, oh, well, performing, those are two different questions. I started as a musician. Um, I didn't have the guts to be a lead singer, although I loved singing. Yeah, so yeah. I played drums in a band for. Uh, for many years and started drums oh, and percussion, uh, which is a lot of fun. And I started when I was maybe 10 or so um, and guitar around the same time. And, and uh, you know, um, <laughs> I, I paid my way through or at least bought my books for uh, for, for my early university years by uh, uh, singing at bar mitzvahs and uh, oh, funny. Um, weddings and that sort of thing. So started off there. Does that pay well, bar mitzvahs? I don't know. No, no. <laughs> I mean, you get a couple hundred bucks for a night, which is, which I guess what, is for, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, for like, what, were you a teenager? Yeah, yeah. That's I was 19, good. 18, 19, oh. somewhere around there. So. I'll take it. I would take that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Can you sing? No. Yeah. Have a Nagila or something like that? Nothing. No, no. I got nothing. See, mm-hmm. even my voice right now, I'm like, <clears throat> it's cracking. Right. Um, so you started off performing. You were doing the drums. Right. And then right. you did you get bit by an acting bug? Or did that sort of come about in college? You know, what's interesting is I because I, there wasn't really a theater program anywhere near me. And certainly being an actor or living that uh you know, choosing that as your life um, wasn't an option at all. Um, but a friend of mine decided that he'd make a movie just out of just out of the blue, uh, and he thought that the the theatricality of me being a singer and a musician would translate. So uh, he um, just after I graduated high school, he made this movie, and I remember being the very first scene I ever shot was I was sitting in a bathroom stall and even that notion of crossing those lines of being in a place that's filthy. But I was you know there was something just so great about that and it felt like uh, I could breathe for the first time I could be who I was oh, I love especially that. coming from a culture that was 
a little bit conservative when it came to emotional expression, getting back to the A, um, and, and you know, my, my family background and all that sort of stuff prevented some of that. So as soon as I got there, I was like, oh, my God, this is great. Right. You know, there's humanity here. Now, when you were my teacher, um, you mentioned a little bit about that, about the sort of... Um closed off from your feelings, especially for men. Right. Was that something that was unique, you think, to your family or to the Canada of uh, culture or I think culture? all of it. I mean, uh, um, any deep-rooted culture, I think, who's gone through some trauma uh, has uh, elements of emotional expression that um, or th- there's some difficulty with that sometimes, and it makes sense, you know. Uh, in terms of where I come from, I'm a Mennonite background, which is not like buggies and, and no electricity. But <laughs> are but, you sure? Uh, <laughs> I feel like I saw a movie once. Where... Could be. I don't know. What um, was that movie that Harrison Ford was in? Was it The Verdict? Yeah, yeah I think One of those so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was like a. Men- I think he was a Mennonite. Well, uh, there's the Hutterites, there's the Mennonites, there's the old Mennonites. For us, like you know, we, oh, wow. it's all sort of normal, you know, except yeah. we're pacifists and all that kind of okay. stuff, or at least you know, culturally. Um, uh, among other things, but um, so, but in that there, there is uh, there's there's a reserve, you know. So that culturally, um, my grandmother grew up, uh, you know, in an abusive home, um, and so she has that added. To, th- there's that through line, and I see it even in me. That anxiety comes from you have to take the temperature of the room because any slight shift is going to create some sort of issue. So so you have to hold back your feelings, you know. Um, that and Canada being a, a place of uh, you know good manners and, and, and uh, civilized behavior. So is it because it's cold? Because <laughs> everyone's just like yes. just don't start any problems. We're freezing. Let's all just you know, go home. <laughs> where, so where I grew up, there's like these weather warnings where exposed skin freezes in two minutes. Like it's minus forty, minus oh fifty gosh. with the windshield. It's like living in space. You know, like you have to. Oh my god, that sounds horrible. You have to plug your car in so the engine block doesn't freeze overnight. Yeah, it's. But it's a particular type of culture. I mean, you stay indoors and play music, you yeah. know, because you and have ho- to. And watch hockey. And watch hockey, yeah. of course. And you're a big hockey fan? Or? I am, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can see some elements of that uh, in my office right a little here. Bit. Yes. Go little Jets. Bit. Yeah. Um, wait, so you don't root for the Kings? <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. My daughter, who's 17 months, um, she uh, grows up in Los Angeles. You know, mm-hmm. she lives here. She's in a town where they've won the Stanley Cup two of the last three years. But she will be uh, a devoted fan of the Winnipeg Jets, who have never and will never um, win anything. <laughs> so, At least you're you're embracing that. Oh yeah, yeah. She will be uh, she will be a hockey loser. Oh yeah. dear. Well, see, yeah. I went to I'm I'm from Oklahoma, and right. my um, college is Oklahoma State, and. If I could count the number of times that they have, like, gotten me on the edge of my seat and then just dropped me off into, like, the ravine of tears. Yeah. Um, it's so heartbreaking because we come so close. They call us Choklahoma State. Oh, that's so sad. It's so sad. Oh. We get so You're close. We're losers. We're oh. our losers. <laughs> I get that. So yeah. are we. Yeah. Occasionally we win, though, and it's like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, right. you know, it's the best feeling in the world. But, yeah, I, I feel that when you're on the losing side of the team. And it becomes a mindset. Like, at a certain point, like, we'll be up by five goals, but every Winnipeg Jet fan knows that we're going to screw this up at some point. Yes, you know? that's it. It's in the back of your mind. It's a matter like, of time. When is it happening? When are we going to choke? And then it's almost like, this is so messed up, it's almost like when they do lose, it's, it makes us feel better because it's a validation of what we believe to be true. Yeah? Right. Well, all is right with the world. <laughs> we knew it was going to happen. We just got embarrassed. It's just a yeah, matter of time. That's what it is. Oh, my yeah. gosh, that's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, how did you then transition down here to LA? Because you did. How long were you in um, Canada before you? Well, your whole life, obviously. But. Yeah, I think I, I <laughs> left for Los Angeles when I was maybe twenty, twenty-two or something. So, I, like right I, after college. Yeah, I just graduated from the University of Toronto, and I went to the U of T. Um, because I had some notions of, I, I don't know whether it was music or what, but I wanted something else in the entertainment industry. You know, So I, I studied philosophy there, which was nowhere near uh, that world of entertainment, but <laughs> no. uh, um, or the arts, and, and, and yet in many ways it is. But, but uh, um, And I, I got an agent there. I just started doing some commercials and stuff because a friend of mine had an agent. And, um, and then it was rather out of the blue that uh, they were casting for um, Star Wars Episode Two for Anakin, and I happened to look like the kid from the first one. So, yeah. Um, 
so that uh, took me to New York and then to Los Angeles, that process. Oh, wow. Um, and How was that? Were you intimidated at all? Or were you like, well, oh, it's just another audition? And... Yeah, I mean, I don't think so I got young. ever. I don't got, I didn't get close, mm-hmm. you know. I right. was sort of uh, But still, just the it. idea of, of even being considered in something in the realm of like Star, a Star Wars would intimidate me and yeah. very much. I, I think it was more exciting. I don't think I had the sense to be intimidated at yeah. that point. I really didn't know. You yeah. Know? So, um, but it, it was a pivotal moment. I remember being in the subway station in Toronto and thinking, okay, I can just go to New York uh, for this one audition, or I can, based on that one audition, I can go to Los Angeles. And so I decided to to not take that bus trip back to Toronto, but to go on to Los Angeles. So it was more just going on this adventure sure. um, rather than thinking that, oh my God, I'm up against whoever I was up against. Right, and, right. Um, so that took me down to Los Angeles. In the meantime, I, when I got to L.A., I, I booked a TV series fairly early that shot back up in Vancouver, so I got back uh, sent back up there. Oh, isn't that ironic? Yeah. You come to L.A. to, to book a show that right. films uh, back up in Canada. Which show was, was, was that, The Immortal? It was The Immortal. You, yeah. You've done your homework. You, you're I digging have. deep. You well, know, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> literally ones of people saw that show. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the deal. Whenever I do this show, I actually do a lot of research on everybody that I interview because I never just want to be like, hey, what's up, buddy? Right. Um, Because that's a little, that's just not me. And my background in journalism won't allow me to do that. Right. In Act 4 of Episode (laughs) 2, you said something that really struck me. (laughs) But then I also get the impression sometimes the people I'm interviewing are a little freaked out because I know so (laughs) much. It's so stalkerish, particularly that show, which nobody saw. It is. I don't mean for it to be, but I'm just (laughs) sort of like, I know everything about you. Um, (laughs) But then again, I don't, which is why I'm here, answering questions. Um, But yes, it was The Immortal. The Immortal. And you did that um fairly quickly and it was what two seasons just one season just yeah. one season uh we were uh yes it's a, it's a longer story we were supposed to go for a second season and then it didn't happen uh and it was my introduction into the was business it like a sci-fi it, it was yeah sci-fi mm-hmm. fantasy sort of deal um but uh, it was a, a great education in terms of the business and yeah. what people say uh may or may not be actualized and yeah. all that sort of stuff now, here's what I remember is one day in class, or I don't know, maybe it wasn't in class where we were just chatting, but yeah. you mentioned that it didn't end up being um, what you thought it was going to be when you booked a series regular. Right. It wasn't as fulfilling um, as you thought it would be. Like, the thing that most actors are striving for is, is I want to be the series regular. I want to be the lead in a feature film. And yeah. then once you get it, for some people, it's like, oh this is hard work. I'm getting up at five in the morning or four in the morning or whatever it might be and staying up all night and I'm exhausted and I'm not, you know, it, it's not meeting those needs. Why, why did it not meet what you were looking for? Was that the show you were referring to when you say that? Or? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and another show that I got later on too. I mean, it's funny. I just had this conversation with, uh, with a client of mine who's coming off uh, the first season of, of a show. And, um, I would venture to say that everybody who, whoever they are, any actor who books a TV series and gets, you know, into it, uh, it's not what they thought it would be. And it goes back to this, and it was getting a little bit weird, this Buddhist notion of ignorance. And uh, it's not being stupid, it's seeing things as they are not. And so many people in their quest for that validation of the show, whatever it is, um, think that it's one thing. And, and they pin all of this stuff, their happiness, like all, once I cross that threshold, it just, it's all, you know, rainbows and every everything's terrific. Um, and it's not the case, because life... You know, is life and. Do you think it's the money that people that's driving people to for that um, that sort of perfect scenario in your head? Because you know, when you're making ten, fifteen thousand, whatever it is yeah. for you know a, a newer actor, yeah. um, an episode that's a lot of money, and I think there's maybe an idea that that will make everything better, right. and that it will make some of the negative things more bearable. Sure. And, and I think um, that it does. Mm-hmm. You know? Sure. I mean, there's a recent study that said that, <laughs> that up to 70 grand mm-hmm. money can affect, you know, um, your happiness. You can buy certain things. You can, uh, Now, beyond 70 grand, whether it's 30 billion or 100,000, mm-hmm. it doesn't change your happiness all that much. But, yes, yeah, certain things are, wow, this I is cool. I don't know. I don't know where... <laughs> I want to know where that article is. Right. There's a big uh, lead between seventy million and but, but, uh, thirty but, billion. Yeah. No, I, I, and and I, I mean I I think that uh, yeah the the point is well taken that that uh, money is something that we all uh, you know it, we can solve some of those problems and it, and it takes up so much room in your brain that God I got to pay this I got to do that I gotta, you know um, 
But the interesting thing is when you take that engine away, what are you left with? You know, why are you doing this? I also think part of it is the validation. You know, it's for so many people, it's a it's a race to get to a certain place or it's a battle. It's a struggle. And it makes it all worthwhile. You get to go home, you know, the hero's journey and say, hey, everybody, I'm on TV. And Uncle What's-His-Name goes, wow, good for you. You know, you really did it, kid. Good job. You know, yeah. all that sort of stuff. It's that so, validation right. from others. But it's all fleeting. The money, yeah. I mean, you cut the money in half. for mm-hmm. So you get a number. Oh, my God. This is, we're, we're there. You know, mm-hmm. I'm in that tax bracket forever. You cut <clears> it in <throat> half for agent, manager, lawyer, mm-hmm. taxes. And then you don't work the next year, the work, at, you know, whatever. And all of a sudden, you know, it's a decent amount, but yeah. it's... Uh, it's not as much as you think, and you have not reached the promised land. You know, and, and it's it's a hell of a thing to say, like, yeah, no, no, you got to do it for the right reasons. You right, know, like right. you shouldn't, as if it's it's saying you shouldn't want to make money, money to, to get a paycheck, yourself. and yeah. and that's not the case. But you have to deal with the truth of the fact that this business is fleeting, and it's it's in love with you, and then it's not like one week to the next, one day to the next. So you're going to have to get right with the truth of that, and figure out your money perhaps outside of it. Um, the way that that I find in the studio, Risa and me, that we find work, like what works for people is what sustains them over a career is finding the joy in this. And it sounds all after school special, but it's the <laughs> truth that like you have to love this. If you're showing up to the, uh, these auditions pissed <clears throat> off and thinking like, ugh, this sucks, they're just going to find some, you know, they're going to get a name and this is going to be awful and I'm going to be embarrassed. Um, it's not going to work for you. You're going to take the real estate exam. So, so you have to figure out a way to, to <laughs> fall in love with this consistently. And I think that's about doing it. Mm-hmm. And so many people come here and their their minds are spinning and they're hustling, but but perhaps not in the right ways. Like, I don't think, and this is a, it's a point of contention, I don't think doing, you know, 50 casting director workshops in six months is necessarily a career plan. Mm-hmm. Um, what if it's all somebody has though like I know you guys say a lot do the work that's a very big motivational thing that's happening right now in the industry do the work get out there do it but what if all somebody has is you know they can't get in a play or they don't have time to commit to you know other things what if all they have is like a casting director workshop or you know a class and that sort of thing does that count towards doing the work do you think um it does, but but I, I don't think, and again, just dealing with the reality of it, what it takes to book this stuff, and as much as like it's happening like just outside our door, there's like casting happens, and what I see works for people are the people who are in the process of it all the time. Um, so that so they are doing a play, and they are finding the time to do what they love. And if your life doesn't allow for that, then that's that's fine. Your life doesn't allow for that. You are where you are. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you know this being a parent, me too. It's a struggle finding any time for yourself, let alone I'm going to take three months and do a play. You right, know? right. Um, but all the same, in, in a fairly consistent way, in as much as you can't really pinpoint what works and what doesn't, you know, every single time, um, it's the people who are in and of it and, a, and creating their own work, writing their own stuff, shooting their own stuff, and doing, po- I think doing podcasts helps. Like mm-hmm. just staying active... And engaged with people yeah. so that you're not just sitting and waiting for the phone to ring um, and, and the totality of your emotional expression or, or your artistic expression is a casting director workshop every week. It's which, not tied up in just, you know, focusing solely on casting. Right. I think that some actors sometimes get, um, not to sound like I'm some sort of guru on actors, but like I know I was at a point where I was like, I have to go to casting director workshops in right. order for them to notice me. So if my agent submits me, they'll be like, oh, sure. I remember this girl from two years ago when right. she did this 30 second scene. Right. That that has not really ever panned out for me. <laughs> but I mean, and it does you know? for some people. Yeah. And, and that's <clears throat> cool. I mean, like be di- you got to be discerning about which ones you do and don't just do them to do them. And, and if you're going to show up and do them, mm-hmm. kick ass. Like show yeah. up with a scene that, that you are going to knock out of the park and not just, oh, this is this rope thing that I do because I'm working towards my career. And yeah, it's another workshop. Yeah. Like be discerning and go in there and and bring it, you know. Um, easier said than done, but all the same. Uh, just so it doesn't turn into some routine. Um, but, but I mean, if like again, it, like it, in some of these scenes even, it's not a full extension of your artistic ability. It's mm-hmm. not... You know, it, it's, it limits you. So um, you want to be working out, you know, that times 50. Uh, and, and I believe that if you're a self-starter, and you have to be, that you can create those opportunities for yourself. And it, it's, it, you know, uh, ex- exercising artistic leadership as opposed to waiting for, oh, I didn't get cast in this or that. To, mm-hmm. You know, all of it means that I'm waiting for someone else to give me permission. Um, you know, you raise up 300 bucks, you can put on a play. You know? Right. And that is a big part of the reason why I started this podcast is because I realized after I had Channing 
that I was just sort of sitting around, you know, only focusing on her 100%, which is okay to a point. To a point. But I think I needed, uh, I know I needed to find some other creative outlet for myself and I needed to find something that would allow me to stay home still and um, care for her in the way that I needed to, but also have a creative outlet to reach out to other creative types and like do something where I wasn't just, you know, talking about potty training and you know sleep issues and all that stuff all the time so that's why I started the podcast and it's been great so far I mean like everybody's been so lovely and supportive and um so that's that's a big reason why I did this and there's Um, I think that when you do something like that and commit to something like that mm -hmm. there's a shift of like it being like your your life is sort of narrow and again like it has to because your focus is Channing but at a certain point even for Channing I'd say because I'm doing this with my daughter my wife right now um, we're having we're hitting walls and, and realizing oh wait a minute we have to open up and make sure that we're caring for ourselves else. as yeah. well and yeah. it's that constant there's a balance. guilt though for parents oh, there's a guilt because you feel like this is my world you know our kids are our world and you don't want to seem like you're being selfish right. um, but it took me a long time to Im- allow myself to embrace who I was before I was Channing's mom. Did right. you find that you had that too? I'm jumping ahead of my story. I want to go back in a minute. Do whatever but you want to do. Like, look, I, I every I, time I walk out the door, mm-hmm. I feel guilt. <laughs> the the, the work life balance for me is very difficult. I come from a place where my father left, and so there's all of that stuff that yeah. I wait a minute. Am I that guy? Like, am I that guy who's just you know at work all the time? Did and, you know? Um, and you know, if I'm doing the math on the hours, you know, I'm, I feel really great about. The, the time that I'm with her mm-hmm. but then the trick is not as I'm sure you know it's not the time it's are you present when you're present you right know? right are you so, on your phone the whole time yeah. or are you checking email or whatever the case right. may be um, your daughter is so beautiful by the <laughs> she's way she's a good kid Thank she's you. adorable yeah. I want to ask you about that though yeah. if you does it bother you when people say your your daughter is beautiful? Doesn't bother me. Uh, okay. but Because I know you have very strong I feminist do, I leanings, do. and I, I totally want to yeah, talk yeah, yeah. about that. Um, <laughs> it's such a tricky thing because she's the most beautiful creature in the world to 100%, me, and my favorite yeah. face ever. You mm-hmm. know, um, but at the same time, uh, <clears throat> I I don't want to limit her I, as as a young girl mm-hmm. that that is the metric that oh she's cute you know. Um, cause I think for boys that changes, mm-hmm. uh, they're cute and then all of a sudden they're tough or they're curious or they're this or they're what, oh, you're interested in okay. science, aren't you? you know? right. Uh, and for girls that, that metric can stay there, mm-hmm. uh, to their detriment, I think. So, so I, I'm, I'm trying not to be a total dick about it, you know, cause people are just <laughs> I being was sweet, yeah, you know? Yeah, I was wondering like, cause some parents are like, please don't tell my child they're beautiful. Yeah. Please I, don't say my daughter is cute. Right. And I want to be like, oh, okay. What, <laughs> you know, like she's hideous and tell her that she is ugly. <laughs> She's never gonna be anything. Um, no, it's tr- there is a there is a strong movement in that way to yeah. a- avoid telling girls that they're pretty. As a mom of a little girl, I don't so have cute. a no, thank you very much. <laughs> I I personally don't have a problem with yeah. it because I know at home and you know with our other family members we're also reinforcing how Definitely. smart she is and yep. reading and like you know the sciences and uh, love of nature and all of that stuff. Right. So. It doesn't bother me because I know she's getting it elsewhere. If she was, like, out in the modeling industry or something and people were constantly telling my two-year-old that she's gorgeous, she's going to be a star, right. you know, then <laughs> oh, maybe. But and I think some of it, too, is, like, that's, that's uh, it's it's imposing our stuff on them. Sure, right. <laughs> right. Which there's a certain amount of that you have to do because we live yeah. in a world where... Our daughters right now, if they were in the job market, you know, they're not, but right. they'd make less money if they were old enough to work, right. you know, than, than men. So there's all that stuff there. But, uh, yeah, I think the, the balanced approach is always the way to go. And it's so tough to do. You yeah. Know, to, to find Where do your feminist always. leanings come from? And also, it's very unusual, I think, to have a man who's such a strong feminist. See, uh, and that... Uh, that doesn't compute with me all that much. Like all the statistics suggest that if women in a culture are doing well and there's equality, then that economy does well, the culture does well. Like that's so. But but it, it comes from um, being raised by strong women and and women who uh, were marginalized at various times, either through abuse uh, or emotional or otherwise. Uh, so it's it's that sort of stuff mm-hmm. and um, the notion that. Uh, my mother, for instance, would have few opportunities. My mother's badass. You know, she's really <laughs> strong uh, and really smart. And so, 
uh, and all the women <clears throat> in my family are like that. Mm-hmm. So the notion that there's some other parallel thing that suggests that they're not just doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me. Right. And I think it it does men a disservice. It does everyone a disservice. Uh, and I don't. Th- I mean, it's it, the issues. Even you know, talk about domestic abuse. Um, victimized mostly, you know, perpetrated against women, um, but it's a male issue, you know, mm-hmm. as much as it is a, 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 a issue with women. So I, I don't see that it's one person's issue or another. It's equality, you know. And do you think that because you have such a strong perspective in that way, do you think you're raising your daughter differently because of it, or are you consciously, like you said, you're like, I'm not, try- I don't want to be a dick, but are you consciously then trying not to? impose those ideals on her like if you had a very strong religious belief you yeah. know it's sort of that yeah. sort of that kind of same thing do you find that you're making conscious choices to not raise her that way um or maybe you are again it's a balance like, you know i pick mm-hmm. my battles like, but if every story that we come out <laughs> you know, that, that that comes out that that she reads that she pulls out of her bookshelf is he did this and he did that i'm gonna switch it you know just sure. i'm gonna say she just because sure. um and again, I think the the pendulum swings so far in the direction of of men that if we pull it back just a little bit, I don't I don't think it's imposing some sort of she's going to hate men or whatever else, you know. Right, so, right. Uh, but I think it's about picking battles and finding, generally finding the humanity in it, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, uh, no, as totally. opposed to picking a side. Yeah, and does uh, your wife um, agree with you on that? Are you guys pretty much in agreement on? this parenting style for like feminist things and you know yeah i think we're both on the same page uh you know just to be um uh, a dick I'll, I'll say stuff like uh you know baba black sheep have you any wool yes ma'am yes ma'am <laughs> Three, you know one for the that's mistress and one for the dame. no 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 but fun. like yeah. so so my wife will sing that song to her and that's the uh-huh. song you know yeah, yes yeah, sir yeah. yes sir through, and and i'll just just to you know but i think i, I enjoy playing that role sure. in life <laughs> sure no totally i i think that's fantastic so i want to back up just a little bit and find out how you transitioned from um, being on the Immortals, <laughs> <laughs> and um, Harold and Kumar right. go to White Castle, which mm-hmm. makes me laugh. Really, okay. um, <laughs> how did you transition from that um, to the acting studio here to BGB? Yeah. Um, I'm sure there was a, a little bit more of a leap there than just now. I'm, I'm doing Harold and Kumar. Now I'm going to do this. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there was a general dissatisfaction with uh, my acting career always. I worked, you know, in the scheme of things, it's all relative, but fairly consistently mm-hmm. for 10 years or so. Um, but, you know, getting it up for auditions, and I, I never found that easy. And, and, and I wasn't the type of person, maybe because I didn't come from this foundation, that, uh, like a theater background or whatever mm-hmm. else, that would, oh, I'm not working, I'll just go do some play in some black box theater or whatever, right. you know. Um, uh, you know, I was a f- I, I was interested in film and TV and that meaning, but it, I think it was always something more for me. It was more about emotional communication and and, uh, and finding that human connection with people. So it was a more general thing other, rather than I need to act all the time. So, um, you know, I've been training acting for a long, long time. I started teaching maybe in 2005, just one-offs here or there with people. Um, and then the writer's strike happened in 2007. So everything shut down. Mm-hmm. It shut down in anticipation of it, then during, and then there was a lot, you know, so and it was then everyone years else. to recover. Right. Some say we haven't even fully recovered from it. Right, and yeah. things have changed so dramatically that, yeah. uh, you know, so. So um, so I uh, um, stepped away and ended up volunteering for the Obama camp, the first Obama campaign for a year and a half or so mm-hmm. uh, here and in Nevada. And it was so interesting because I, I ended up, uh, I went to the first training outside of Chicago, um, and they were telling me stuff about acting about how to, you know, get the message of the campaign across was not about telling some company line, but offering your emotional truth of why you're supporting then-Senator Obama. Who is telling you that, the campaign? The campaign. So this guy called Marshall Gans, who Mm -hmm. uh, is this brilliant guy, and uh, he writes a lot of books about community organizing. He teaches at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and he's, he was, uh, um, um, you know, played a a part in the civil rights movement. And so, really, it's like person-to-person human connection crafting your story of self. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, there's just elements of stuff that I was teaching people already. And, and he knew that you were an actor, and so he came to you. So it was it was, like, it was a it was a, a group of us. A so group. it was okay. it, it was it was a workshop almost. Okay. So he didn't know me. Sure, you know, sure, sure. Did. But he but sort of like as a uh, a catch all for all the actors. He was like, here's how you can share your story. So it wasn't to actors. It was to, to people who were going to work on the campaign. Oh, oh it was I a see. training for the campaign. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So and uh, uh, and it blew my mind that there were practical applications to all this stuff. You yeah. know. So, 
Um, so I started integrating some of that stuff into uh, my teaching and thinking about teaching more. Um, and around that time, it was, I, was, I got back to training martial arts uh, in a different way, meditation and Tai Chi as opposed to um, kicking and screaming and you know, that sort of stuff. Um, so there was a shift in me and, and uh, I started doing corporate training as well and uh, uh, using elements of acting teaching, um, Buddhist principle martial arts and mm-hmm. the campaign training, all that together. And so I did that for a few years and uh, I was still acting a little bit here and there. Uh, and I've, I'd known Risa for many years. She put me in CSI New York in this uh, pilot called Three Pounds. Um, and then we just started talking about uh, about doing a workshop together. It just sort of went from there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we decided to, to open up the studio. Yeah. Um, I want to touch on your... Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I want to touch on what you just said about your Buddhist principles. Um, I'm so country. I say Buddhist. Is that bad? I don't think so. I think Buddhist. that's what it is. You can say Buddhist or Buddhist or whatever you want to say. I always you know, feel I like I'm, I'm, um, I'm being a little bit of a poser if I say Buddhist because right. that's my country showing it. We say Buddha. Right. right. That's fine. I think that's I, don't either way. judge me, you know, Steve. Either way. I'm not judging at all. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to know like how you got into all of that because your office, your lifestyle, the way you teach, everything is it, that is immediately clear to me that you have this um, deeper calm and this deeper presence. I noticed that right away as a teacher, you were very chill. You don't, you were not yelling at anybody. I've been in classes before where the teachers are like, no, no, no. Or they're spraying you with squirt water bottles and like, wow. yeah, it's That's awful. It's very strange to me. I've been um, in some of those classes. So. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm <laughs> sure we know. <laughs> um, but uh, I, It's interesting to me how your technique and your style, did it grow out of your meditation and out of your um, Buddhist training and all of that? Um, Tell me about that. Well, first of all, uh, are you going to say Buddhist like that? Buddhist? No, that's that's fine. No, that's fine. It's fine. It's fine. However you want to say it's fine. Oh, what a dick. No, no, you're fine. fine. (laughs) Um, So uh, I don't feel calm. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's funny you say that. Really? You don't? Oh, wow. There's a lot. uh, Yeah, there's... I have a lot of anxiety. I'm an ang- like there's a lot of anger. I'm, really? I'm, I'm managing all that stuff a yeah. lot. Um, and the interesting thing about, and I'm sure you know this too, about um, raising a kid is it brings all that stuff up. I mean, it's just oh, a totally yeah. different challenge to oh. manage it all, to process it. To um, so so there's that, and I think that's what drove me to uh, the practice of Buddhism. And for me, it's like I I, I feel like a poser calling myself a Buddhist. I uh, uh, why. Well, because it, it's a it, it's a practice. It came to me through martial arts, mm-hmm. and so uh, I mean, I know some people for whom you know this is the lifestyle, and mm-hmm. they're monks and they live in monasteries, and mm-hmm. uh, and they're so great you don't teachers. Think and you could be a real Buddhist if you're not. <laughs> it, it's uh, in a monastery. I don't I don't know what a real Buddhist is, okay. but but for, for me, it's you know, um, and I have an aversion. I think just coming from. Um, you know, a, a background, a Western background of Christianity, and we, we mm-hmm. know what's been done in the name of religions. And I have an aversion to religion in the first place. For me, it's a practice, and it's really pragmatic. It's just, it's the practical stuff of how do I deal with the fact that I have anxiety and anger and dissatisfaction with life. Mm-hmm. As it relates to my acting teaching, uh, I was that guy for a couple years, Maybe more that would and, yell and be more aggressive with not students. Not would squirt people with guns, but <laughs> but but um, or throw things at students. Yeah, not I. Um, but who would engage in a really emotional way because it's mm-hmm. it, you know the work is charged sometimes that would engage with them in that and mm-hmm. so be really passionate about yeah. that and if they were holding back, take it personally and need them to get there because it's fucking important mm-hmm. and this is the work you know all that. Yeah, sort of yeah, stuff. yeah. And for me, I realized that that doesn't get people where they need to be, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, There's some people who, uh, that's where they are, and people have um, walls for reasons, you know? So me screaming at them and knocking down the walls, uh, you know, by screaming at them, is the stuff of my ego, it's not the stuff of them. And so that's not not acting training that they can walk away with and take Mm -hmm. with them and actually create change in their lives, which is what we're doing. So you you don't, so what is your feeling on, on like... um acting techniques like the method you know and stuff like that where people do like really immerse themselves into the emotional um uh trauma of whatever it is that they're you know performing or you know the drugs the sex you know, whatever it might be sure does that sort of then go against kind of your philosophy for teaching well it doesn't or do you and think there's so a place for that 
there's absolutely a place for that. And, and um, let me also say that there's a time to push. So, I mean, it's very much like like chess or like martial arts or sparring mm-hmm. or business. Or there's a time for action and a time for stillness. Mm-hmm. And so if I see a moment when me pushing will uh, elicit uh, uh, a change from within, I will push and I will come hard um, because I believe that's in the interest of the actor. And, and I don't always win that battle, but it's, it's an ego fight. And that's what I'm uh, fighting against as a teacher. That's my journey is to try to limit the ego and, and do what I can to help actors. Um, but, you know, in, in, in Buddhism it's, it, as well, it's not that every moment is calm. And, it's right. about managing the fact that the first noble truth of Buddhism is that life is suffering, that bad shit's going to happen. Mm-hmm. The storm's going to come. Mm-hmm. So in, in the interest of reflecting that as an actor, f- reflecting the universe, um, you're going to have to feel that storm. And so, yeah, there are moments when there's big anger and big sadness, and you get to explore that and how wonderful... Um, and, and, and but then there's there's got to be a proportional amount of finding the calm and taking good care of yourself as a human being uh, so that you can come back and do that again you know uh, but you know b- people are on their own path actors and whatever whatever you need to do to explore whatever you need to explore that's fine um, there's a line between you uh, you know uh, shooting up heroin in your life and, <laughs> yeah. uh, in the interest of your art but that's up to you you know you yeah. find out what works for you and what doesn't um, I'm so disappointed no one has asked me to shoot up heroin yet because yeah. I would try it. Gotta I'm just going to put work. that out there for the work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would write try it. it. Um, it. Anyway, yeah, I, say, I write my own part. Right. I would do like my own nurse Jackie, you know, with like a, a, pro, a drug problem. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, I noticed um, <clears throat> when, uh, when I was in your class, we did a lot of Meisner technique. Mm-hmm. So I have very specific feelings about the Meisner technique. Yeah. I don't know if I just, and I'm going to reveal maybe too much about myself here. I don't know if I feel like I connect to that technique particularly. Maybe it just doesn't work for me, the repetition. Um, But I know it works for some people. I just don't know. What am I I missing about (laughs) the Meisner technique? (laughs) I guess ultimately is is what I want to know. Because you like that technique, right? Well, it's, uh, I do. And Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, for me, it, it... works uh it works and i think that's the big thing okay and every creature is different yeah and so uh you're coming to this place with uh, history and experiences and uh even if it is that you were in a meisner class once and somebody screamed at you and was a total jerk that, or what, whatever <laughs> right, the right. thing is or, or the specifics of the techniques of, e- of each exercise mm-hmm. so it doesn't work for you fine mm-hmm. and and i don't think that that needs to be seen as you know, you're missing anything. You yeah. just, that, that's not where you're at. Because I always fine. feel like I'm not doing it right. Yeah. Or maybe I'm just overthinking it. Um, almost every acting class I've had has done some sort of miser. And yeah. for me, I start to kind of internalize it and go, well, it's because I didn't grow up studying theater. You know, maybe I was, it's because I didn't, I wasn't on Broadway at 12 right. or whatever. And, um, I just don't get it yeah, kind of a sure, thing. Sure. And I start to really anal- analyze it, get in my head, and then I'm like, well, it just doesn't work for me, yeah. and I want to try something else. And, and if it, I mean, that's the opposite uh, effect that you want. If it's right. going to put you in your head and right. make you beat yourself up right. and just be another way that, uh, that you know, you turn up the dial on shame and self-consciousness. And, right. But I want to be, I would love to be good at it. I would love to be, um, to find something, because I find that when I go out on audition sometimes, I, um, <clears throat> I don't often have the tool belt that I need or like the tools to be able to pull out mm. on a last minute audition or something like that to be effective or be competitive with people who've been doing it for 20, 30 years. I mean, I've been only doing acting um, professionally for about eight years. Yeah. And, you know, I know there's a lot of actors out there who the reason why they take acting classes and they do plays and things like that is because they want to get better. I mean, I hope that's why they're doing it. Right. Um, and be more comfortable in their skin in an audition, but also in the performance itself, whether sure. you're on set or on stage or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I feel like I can walk into an audition room and be confident and do well. And then I go on the set and I'm like, Bleh. you know, like I, I feel why like a phony. What's different, do you think? Um, I don't know, maybe because of the competition side of the audition, I'm right. very highly motivated when something is competitive. Yeah. Like I can, I also have taken a ton of audition classes mm-hmm. where I know exactly what beats to hit, where, if it's a comedy, I know where they want it to be funny and yeah, you know yeah. where to wait and let someone else be funny. But um, on set, 
there's like this um, insecurity that creeps in mm-hmm. because I don't get to do it every day. I do yeah. it maybe once every couple of months if I'm lucky. Right. And if you only got to come to your job once every couple of months, sure. you certainly wouldn't feel very confident going in. Um, and then also nobody on set gives you direction in a class. Like, you know, you tell us, um, uh, try it this way. Or, you know, what are you thinking when you're doing this? Like, there's a there's a process. They don't do that on a television sh- right. uh, set. I mean, and I, and I think that's what, what working really consistently does is mm-hmm. it, it gives you uh, artistic aware- self-awareness. Mm-hmm. You know, this is who I am as an actor and comfort right. in that. So you get to... You get to know yourself. You get friendly with yourself because you've done it. You've been through right. experiences with yourself. And, and it, that duality is interesting because I think when you are in the thing and, and you've let go, you know, you are outside of yourself. You are just engaging an instinct and mm-hmm. so you're not necessarily in control. So to have the confidence in, in, the, in your talent, um, that, that translates to when you're on set, when no one's giving you direction. Right. And again, in that, you can exercise artistic leadership and perhaps have a better sense of, well, if they're not saying anything, then it's fine. Because yeah. no one's no messing around here. Tips, and no no yeah. one's doing you any favors and right. just not saying, she's awful, but don't tell her. That's you know? my fear. That's your fear <laughs> right. as an actor is that they're sitting there going, oh, my God, who hired this chick? She is horrible. Right. You know? And it's it's uh, because you don't have any friends on set. You're just there maybe for a day or if you're lucky, a guest, a guest star for a few days or something. And then you go home and... Nobody says anything, you know. And they probably don't say anything because they're busy, but also or there because... there was no issue. They're, yeah. yeah, certainly. Because, I mean, it's always been my experience that no one, mm-hmm. when it comes down to it, because everyone's job is on the line, no one's mm-hmm. really going to accept, you know, really bad work and not say anything. They're going right. to try to figure this out somehow yeah, yeah. so that they don't look bad. Everyone's worried about their own jobs. But, 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 yeah, most people are just worried about their own experience. I think, too, actors were such sensitive creatures that it's nice to hear somebody say, good job, you know? Right. Um, that's something I struggle with, too, with my daughter, is that there's a, there are a lot of studies that say, oh, you shouldn't just blindly say, good job, on mm-hmm. things. You shouldn't right. just pat them on the back and just give them a reward. Right. Um, because it doesn't um, tell them why they're doing a good job. Right. Like, you know, that's it, a pretty right. painting, instead of saying, oh, you used a lot of orange and blue. It's and, the Carol Dweck stuff, the, the uh-huh. mind, mindset of, yes. like, you, you're... Mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're uh, um, patting them on the back and saying that that talent is fixed and you have it, so congratulations. And yeah. if you don't, don't even try. That yeah. sort of thing. Um, <laughs> do you find yourself with your daughter? Um, uh, do you think she's going to have any uh, artistic leanings? Like, do you want her to go into the showbiz uh, here in Hollywood? We are in Hollywood. People ask me constantly, right. "Are you gonna? Is Shannon gonna be in modeling? Is she gonna be an actor?" And I'm sure. like, oh, I don't know. You think about that, right? Because you think. Uh, it's an you think of the child assumption. stars, sure. who, who mm-hmm. and you think you and me who got into this mm-hmm. relative to you know the mm-hmm. person who grew up here or right. um, you know, we did it on purpose. One of the Fanning <laughs> sisters or something who like right, who was right. born into this thing, mm-hmm. uh, and yeah, it'll be available. I mean, Daddy works at an acting studio, mm-hmm. work with actors every day. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe there'll be some interest there. I don't know. I mean, we love music too, and that's what we like. We go to Guitar Center every weekend, sometimes twice. Oh, that's so cute. We just play drums, and like she likes all that stuff. I wanted to have uh, uh, a bunch of really clear outlets for her emotional life, mm-hmm. and if you know her first seventeen months or any uh, indication, she's a really emotional kid. She's got big, big feelings. Which oh my is gosh! Great. So does Channing. So great! It's congratulations. You it's know. good, but <laughs> yeah. also sometimes right. makes me curl up in a ball and want to cry myself. Of course. Do you? Are you guys? And you don't have to admit if you want to, but are you doing any, dealing with any tantrums and like any outbursts yeah. and stuff like it's, that? It's just starting now. Um, and yeah, about seventeen months. That's yeah. when sh- that chant started. About fifteen, sixteen months. So it's you know. Uh, yeah. Up, up, up. Okay. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Up, up, up. And then it's on the floor, and it's that. Yeah. So, you know, not too, too many of them. And mm-hmm. um, uh, it's, you know, she's not breaking stuff yet, but <laughs> she's got big feelings. I mean, I, I hope, and this is one of those things that I know I will take back in four months when something else comes up, and I mm-hmm. think I have it locked down, and I you know, this is my assessment right. of what's happening with my daughter. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, for the most part, now, my wife and I are pretty good at feelings. Feelings are my business, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like I yeah, deal with yeah. people all the time who have tantrums right. um, in a wonderful way. <laughs> so uh, we're pretty good at identifying them, and, okay. you know. Uh, but, yeah, man, when you want to get something done and it's just mm-hmm. uh, they're in control and, they're you know, they're having their moment, they're having their moment, it all stops. Yeah, that's a struggle I have with... Um, 
whenever we're trying to uh, change the environment, leave to go somewhere or leave. Wh- she's having a great time at preschool right now. This is a big one. Is oh. every day, every time I go pick her up at preschool, it's meltdown city and I know it's going to happen so I now am trying to like come up with all of these ways to get her to know the transition from leaving yeah. is going to be fun so pick her up at like 10pm okay. now yeah right <laughs> I just call them and go I'm going to be late <laughs> she's fine she wants to be yeah, there yeah right she does not want to leave <laughs> oh. um, I mean and again on the one hand that's great that she's it's in, great but yeah and I'll oh. remind her when she's 15 and doesn't want to go to school and is like yeah. mom I don't want to get out of bed and yeah, I'm going to be yeah. like when you were two you love school right. um, but she just and has like, like shut up i hate you yeah i know I oh my god i'm dreading that day i know yeah. it's gonna happen i mean and but friends of ours who it. have like a six-year-old they, they were talking about how Has it already even happened? at five it's she's like i don't love you and slamming the door <gasps> that sort of stuff it's like, oh, oh my god just i'm dreading that you. i don't i will probably stand strong in her face when that happens i hope she doesn't listen to this but then i will go and cry my eyes out right. like because you have, it's my baby, and Ugh. if she ever says that to me, I just it would be like a knife to the heart. Ugh. So it's yes, awful. I too have a very highly emotional, deep feeling Good child, you. and um, uh, I won't be one of those obnoxious parents and say it's going to get worse for you, but it might. <laughs> but it will. <laughs> yeah. But no, it will. We have that sense. Yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> so things are going really well here at the studio. It seems yeah. like you guys. Um, have tons of classes. You also do a lot of um, philanthropic things. Did I use that word correctly? I think you did. All right. Yeah. I feel pretty proud of myself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you guys uh, are not just an acting studio. You you do lots of things in the community as well, which I think is really great. Um, and if people want to find out more about classes, how can they do that? They can go to bramangarciabron.com mm-hmm. uh, and all the information's there. Just go to the website. And you also have a podcast that you do where people we do. can listen. Yeah. yeah, that's just on our blog, bramangarciabron.com slash blog. Slash blog. Uh, Got it. <laughs> uh, so there's that too. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, thank you very much it's for letting thank me you come so much and for like. Talk a little parenting with you of and course, a little acting. Of course, of course. It's two things that are very close to my heart, obviously. So um, I really appreciate you letting me talk to you oh, about it so and thank pick you. your brain. Um, thank you so much for listening, everybody. If you have a chance, uh, go to motherhoodinhollywood.com. I'm going to post a whole bunch of information about Steve and about the studio there, as well as follow me on Instagram at Motherhood in Hollywood and on Twitter at MIH Podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody. And Steve, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Mama funny. Balls.